Well, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for coming to uh, Leeds Combined Arts October evening event. And um, this evening we have, um, I'm very pleased and I'm very excited to uh, be presenting um, Richard Smith, who's our uh, chair and uh, main organiser at the moment, obviously with the help of June, but anyway, um, who has got a wonderful presentation of fantastic pictures of Vienna and uh, all those wonderful things from the Habsburgs and stuff like that. But before we get into that, I've uh, just got a couple of things to um, announce. Um, first of all, Sunday the 19th of November, this uh, Sunday, uh, uh, well no, in about a month's time, a walk from Bramhope to Cookridge by the railway air shafts. Oh, that sounds interesting. Four miles on a gently undulating terrain. I've been under the train, obviously, in the tunnel a long time. It must be interesting going on the top. That this is with uh, Richard uh, Bynarski, who's uh, also one of our long-standing members, and they will meet at the in the centre of Bramhope. Details, including times of X84 bus to Bramhope, to be confirmed near the date, and that will be put round by email. And uh, we'll follow the path above the railway tunnel and the air shafts along easy, pleasant terrain. We'll call at the Crag Hill Farm Cafe and admire the delightful secret garden there. Ooh, I haven't been there myself. We will then resume our walk to the outskirts of Cookridge to catch the number six bus back to Leeds at bus times to follow walk leader Richard Boynovsky and uh, shall I put the phone numbers out? Yeah, yeah phone numbers uh, 0113 234-7688 or 077-4961-2270. And the other event is that next month, for the um, third Thursday uh, at 7.15 event, we are very honoured to have Professor Peter Bull um, performing, um, I believe, something worthy of his position as an emeritus position, professor at York. And I believe it's going to be um, some medieval stuff with uh, possibly, um, if we're really lucky, a hurdy-gurdy. Mm -hmm. I've just seen one yeah. number of that. So anyway, that's a very big thing to look forward to and I hope people will uh, remember that to come along. But now it's over to Richard Smith with uh, Visions of um, yeah, Austria. And oh, and Bratislava as well. And we're starting out with something that is well beyond the, oh. the Habsburgs in time. But anyway, over now. So, on to Richard. Right. Just watching the wires. Okay. Right. Good evening all. Evening. Or should I say good evening to the chosen and enlightened and wise few. Right, what I'm going to give a talk, well, the talk is actually uh, about art, it was on the poster, so I'm not giving the title again. The emphasis is on the photographic. Now before beginning, I'm going to give you an idea of the structure, and then we'll, we'll go through the photographs. After this one, it'll be batches five at a time each showing a different age. Now, I'm not an art teacher, I'm a historian. So the emphasis will be on how the works of art we look at emphasised or highlighted what was going in the societies at the time. So we're looking at the interface between cultural and social change and art. Sometimes if it's something really delightful, we may stop and have a look and gawp at it. But that, that's the emphasis, it's focusing on the hi historical conditions that built the art. I'd also s s show you that uh, there are various books and there are various maps which I can show you of the Austro-Hungarian Empire which will give you an idea. The photographs were taken from Vienna which is on the Danube and Bratislava, capital of Slovakia which is about 60 miles to the east but still on the Danube, but a very different atmosphere there. The Austrians, I found, were cold but efficient, whereas the Slovakians were very warm but less efficient. There was a real change in cultural atmosphere in those two countries. Now anyway, without further ado, I shall go through the pictures. So this is the introductory picture. 
from 4000 BC and it was a copper spiral pendant of that time. It was the time before the Egyptians they were even building their pyramids and it was the time when the first civilizations were beginning to do on were appearing on the Euphrates. That pendant was clearly owned by someone of a high status. We think possibly a tribal chief to show that there was a big man about. So already from 4000 BC we have an idea that culture and values produce the art and the art tells us about the society which gave birth to it. Now we're going to do a batch of five study. Now this shows you the geography of the area of the Danube River. Carry one, carry on, run and do that. Yeah. Now this is interesting. That was the frontier of the Roman Empire, and that's the river Morova going into it. And you can understand why the Romans didn't want to go any further than that. So we're trying to look at the geography in which the art we're going to look at occurred. Move on. And again, that over there you can just see Austria, and again that's the Danube. The Turks, when they were marching onto Vienna in 1683, marched along here. Still don't like the Turks to this day. Let's move on. And again, another uh, views. That's a view of another river, and we actually swam in that river further upstream. And uh, I thought, why not have some wildlife? But to our surprise, we saw some swans in the Danube actually ducking and diving under, it was cleaner than I thought. So, so much for the geography. It's a land of very fertile land, woodland, forests, and a lot of rivers. And very flat, ideal for invading armies and the movement of peoples and cultures. Let's move on now. Well, this shows you the urban landscape in which a lot of the art took place. This is a view of Vienna from St. Stephen's Tower. Let's move on. Uh, and you can see the roof already, which I used for the cover of the LCA magazine. That shows you Bratislava. That's the UFO restaurant, Hideous. And these show you hideous high-rise blacks from the communist era. Oh yeah, I should stop to use that. There they are. Where did you get up to that restaurant? Sorry. I haven't a clue. I used to think we, we could have done it as a lift that takes you on. It's supposed to be a lift, but, but what you can see is, you can see the, how the communist flats were like barracks. Very impersonal. Uh, uh, because Bratislava was communist throughout the Cold War. Vienna ceased being occupied in 1955. Oh, by the way, I recommend, if you want to know what Vienna was like after the war, watch the film The Third Man. It's brilliant. And let's move on. And that shows you Bratislava. Again, very Central European architecture with a Catholic church up there. Move on. Another views of Bratislava. Very urban landscape. Now we're back to Vienna. Now here you have Roman remains. That is a 19th century sewer. Now what those Romans remains reveal both here and in Bratislava was there were forts. This was frontier territory for the Roman Empire. Though at one point they crossed the Danube and took what's now Romania. And again, more Roman remains. And I'm afraid some of the pictures are a little bit dark, but this shows you the statues in the, in the Austrian Museum. Move on. That's Hadrian. So Hadrian's influence was felt in Vienna. It was also felt in Jerusalem and North Africa. He got around, he visited the whole of the Roman Empire and had rude wrong songs about him, about his travels and what he got up to. <coughs> Let's move on. That shows you one of the problems with the art of the ancient world. That head does not match that body. Somehow, uh, the, 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 someone found the body, found the head, and tried to stick the two together. So you've got combined arts, quite literally, <laughs> yeah. a head combined to a body. <laughs> Let's move on. This shows you again Romans remains, this time near Bratislava, 3rd century, 4th century fort. So it's very much frontier territory. 
But Daniel was the boundary between civilization and barbarity. Now, this is an interesting place. This was St. Rupert's Church, we think built in the 7th or 8th century, the oldest building in Vienna. Built like a fort because you had to be, because uh, the barbarians might come in. And it was built near what was then the dockland of the River Danube, because it was a big salt area. So salt would come up and the, pe and the trades people who trade in salt paid to build that church. Now, very austere inside, a lot of medieval stuff which I've not got here. But what I did find, we went to a concert in St. Rupert's Church, and it sounds great. We went to a concert in Vienna. Oh, how snooty. Oh, don't tell people so much as we fell fast asleep. <laughs> Let's move on. Now, this shows you the Dark Ages. And you can't read, whether it's work of art or not, you could quibble over but it shows you the warrior culture of the time, the violence of the time, the swords and the chain mail and the axe. These are weapons which are very convenient to bring to LCA committee meetings. <laughs> but uh, but that, and again, that shows you a warrior's helmet. We think it was ceremonial. It wasn't practical for battle. But again, the exaltation of violence and the warrior culture. Oh, of course, we have to have a skull. Always more interesting when you put a skull or skeleton in the presentation. That we think was of a Hun, one of Attila the Hun's lot. And what they used to do was they used to bind the skulls and elongate them when they were babies. So that skull, instead of going like an oval like that, went. And that's an elongated skull. And they, uh, and they bound it as babies. They were trying to show skulls to show they were different. And no wonder people at the time thought they were devils from hell. So that's what we really damaged. Well, given the violence, well, who knows? Now this shows you a sort of late Dark Age medieval costume, reconstructed from paintings and that sort of thing. It's not the real thing, but it's a good reconstruction. And it shows, obviously, nobles, kings, and the emphasis on furs. If you had furs, it was a sign of status, and it kept you blinking warm in the Central European winter. Lord and Lady. And unfortunately, we're now into the Middle Ages. This is a bit dim, but it shows you the top of St. Stephen's Cathedral. You can just make out the architecture and the roofs. The engineering which went into it was incredible. And we found out York Minster, but it applied to St. Stephen's. They had all these statues and stuff near the top of the church where no one could see them. Do you know why? Those statues were for the glory of God and for his presence alone. So, anyway, let's move on. And there was that customer for you. Uh, and this shows you some of the stained windows. This shows you official Catholicism in the Middle Ages. There's priests uh, with a mass, various kings and queens. It states religion. This is the church saying, this is us, it's here to stay. But in fairness, they thought, well, we should bring a bit of light and beauty to the life of peasants. And what could be more light and beauty than that? So the idea was, we must show the beauty of God to unenlightened peasants. And the stained glass windows was one way of doing it. And somehow, I think they succeeded. This shows you the idea of the saint, someone holding a change. I think it may be Saint Augustine. Not keen on him, um, because he laid the foundations for the Spanish Inquisi for, for, for the Inquisition. But it shows you again official Catholicism. A man with a Bible, always with a beard, very patriarchal, and robes. It looks a bit of a misery, doesn't it? But shifty it, like it. Yeah, shifty. Let's move on. And again, this shows you standard medieval pictures of the Annunciation, slightly cartoonish. But it will betide you if you were a priest or a vicar if you crossed a mason, because you would be sure to be a very hideous gargoyle stuck on top of the church. In York Minster, there was one gargoyle of the diseases that afflicted man, and one was of someone with dysentery, and it was supposed to have been based on the Chancellor of York Minster in the Middle Ages. So sometimes, that, and you never crossed the masons because you needed them. And he didn't want to be portrayed as an ugly gargoyle. 
And this shows you lots of statues, Madonna and baby, Madonna and baby, hundreds of them. Let's move on. Now we're beginning to move to the different age, the early Renaissance, the invention of print, printing, Gutenberg, the printing press. And it was the printing, which was the information technology of the time, which really broke the Middle Ages because you could get information all over the place. When Martin Luther's theses were published in 1517, it was said that within a week they were across the whole of Germany, within two weeks across the whole of Europe. Why? Because of the printing press. So he initiated the technological revolution which led from the medieval to the modern age. Now this is an interesting one. It's not artistic, is it? I suppose it could be modern art in the Tate Gallery, just about. But that is a Turkish cannonball, which was fired during the siege of 1683, crashed into a wall, and have kept it hanging there ever since. So a lot of Viennese art was born during times of great turbulence, of warfare, and the fear of invasion by the Turks. And, and uh, in Bratislava there were other cannonballs from the Napoleonic era, just to remind people of what had happened. Now this shows you, it's a, I'm afraid a very poor picture, but it shows you the relief of Vienna. This is official war portraiture. The relief of Vienna from the Turks by the Polish government, by the Polish cavalry charge. And, and that shows you explosions, it shows you the walls, that's St. Stephen's unchanged, it shows you the Poles charging into the nasty Turks. And, uh, um, and also, it shows you the era of the Counter-Reformation. The church is back after the Reformation, and that place shows you the Cardinal's hat. The church saying, we run this place, this is official, this is ours. And they used to do that when they took over Protestant churches in the Counter-Reformation. When it came to butchery, the bar. This man, now this is an official portrait. Rather like a portrait you would get on a coin or whatever. It's an engraving of a, the Emperor Augustus Ferdinand. He's got a twirly moustache. Early 17th century contemporary of James I and uh, Charles I. Big rough. And his policies and his persecution of the Protestants led to the Thirty Years' War. 25% of the population of Germany were killed, and in Brandenburg and Prussia it was 40 to 45%. He began a genocidal struggle in Europe which lasted 30 years. And the Germans today still say the Thirty Years' War was a worse misfortune than the Second World War. So that's the portrait, but of a stupid, arrogant, bigoted man who brought disaster to Europe and untold misery to both Catholics and Protestants and the atrocities in the Thirty Years' War. Oh. He looks like Vincent Price. He does, <laughs> given, what, given the effect that he did. And the word August yeah. describes him, doesn't it? What? August. The word that goes there. That's the oh, yeah. name. Yeah. So oh, that's him. That is the man who started and commenced Europe's greatest wars of religion. And uh, I thought I'd keep that. Now this shows you official art buildings of the 18th century. We're beginning to move away from the wars of religion because after all that butchery and after surviving the shield, the second siege of Vienna in 1683, they decided it was time to begin to get enlightened and learn. And it'll be interesting we'll to see whether we'll have another react, uh, enlightenment. So that shows you, say, well, now this was my favourite building. Oh, wow. It's one of the biggest libraries in Europe. Built by Charles VI, the father of Mary Theresa, whose portrait is on the book. Let's go forward. There he is. Now I'm going to pause here. I look at it as artwork. The green was actually, I think, in the original because of the lighting. He's portrayed as a Roman emperor, as a Caesar, as a world conqueror. 
you know, above the common herd. In reality, he lost virtually every war and fought in only one, one battle. So that's him portraying, portraying himself as Julius or Augustus Caesar. He was more like a third century Roman emperor who led his army into a swamp. But that's the official portrayal. It's celebrating him. And there are lots of statues. There's one there celebrating great men, great learning. But though Charles VI was hopeless in many ways, as a rule, political ruler, as a cultural ruler, and as a cultural ambassador for his time, he was brilliant. Political failure, a cultural success. And you do find out about the Habsburgs. This shows you the ceiling above the library. This shows you the tourists looking quite wondrous. Carry on. Shows you a globe. Richard, what's the library called? The state, it's called the State Library, it's the State Hall. Now we could go on to some portraits of the 19th century. Now behind these portraits there are stories. This is very official, isn't it? It's all in braided areas, buttons, medals. He was actually the Emperor Maximilian, the younger brother of Franz Joseph. Now, Franz Joseph gave him another disastrous ruler who helped trigger the First World War, but we'll come on to that, was the younger brother. Franz Joseph said, well, I can't have him here. He's causing trouble. It doesn't matter because I've got the throne and he's got nothing. So a, when French ruler, Napoleon III, not the Napoleon, Napoleon the Little, as Bismarck called him, said, oh, we're setting a colony in Italy, in Mexico. Would you like to be the king? And he said, oh, yes. And Franz Joseph said, Yes, go, my dear brother, go, my dear brother. You're entitled to the throne. Well, it lasted from about 1867 to 1873. There was a revolution. Uh, he was arrested and shot. And that Franz Joseph uh, just said, hmm, and carried on with his daily routine. So, a tragic figure. And this shows you some of the Napoleonic uniforms. Let's move on. That shows you again military pictures. There are lots of pictures of generals. One of the medal. I think he was the one on the Rod Rodesky on the Rodesky march. Can we move on? Ah, this is the emperor Ferdinand. Now he was an emperor from 1835 to 1843. It tries to make the most of him, but he was born with water on the brain. He could barely stand up, uh, and uh, he was married to the, this lady from Germany who wasn't told about what it was like. And, when, and at his wedding day, he had to be piled up by corpses. This is a study of disability. And yet, he was so kind and affectionate that their marriage, which had, could have been a disaster, turned into a love match. And when he abdicated in 1848 through circumstances that were not of his own fault, uh, she stayed by him and said it was a privilege to look after him. And Franz Joseph, his nephew, really, uh, you know, when he had abdicated, passed the throne to an 18-year-old Saint Franz Joseph in 1848, he said, it is my pleasure. He was a gentleman, he wrestled with disability and saw the need for reform and saw the need to promote or help the lower classes in his society. Partly because I think he knew what it was like to be marginalised. So that is a study of disability. And they made the best of it. And that's his wife, who stood by him. He lived for another 30 years after his implication. She died shortly after. She was a very sensible woman, and she stood by him. And it was a love match in the end. Now this shows you, unfortunately, blows some battles, which I have to move on quickly. Now again, this is an example of official art. It shows, uh, it shows an Austrian duke being trying to be victorious. Again, in Vienna, a lot of official art, a lot of propaganda art, <coughs> and trying to win the people through visual display. Let's move on. <coughs> there he is. Also celebrating culture, Mozart. I couldn't resist having my picture 
in front of him, you know, obviously basking in reflected glory. But don't worry, he's been spared that. And that's Mozart. So they were celebrating their culture. Because from the 18th to the 19th century was the most brilliant way of culture. And that shows you Goth, a great philosopher. And like all philosophers, was an utter misery. <coughs> now, one of the greatest artworks was the cemetery. We loved the cemetery. It had about five million, was it? Yes. <coughs> Bigger cemetery in Europe, miles around. And they made an art of death. If, we, if we're going back to Vienna, we'll be revisiting the cemetery and having a good exploration. And a lot of the gravestones told a story. This tells the story of a man who was in the army. This tells you the story of Maya Michael Adler, someone who was linked to psychology. This show celebrates a woman who cared for the poor. It's telling people the story of their lives. This shows you a woman, the interesting is, I think she must have been saved from a big shipwreck. She's kind of commemorating that she was saved from a shipwreck, and that's her. And, and also, they love to show off their graves and who had the biggest graves. Talk about status, you know. Dr. John Pritz, go back, just go back to that. And that was Dr. John Pritz, so you had a lot of Dr. John Pricks. And you had one musical letter musical master showing him at a, at a not conducting an orchestra but at a lecturing his students very bearded very stern and if i have a grave in vienna i insist on having it engraving of me giving a talk to you lot don't want to be enthusiastic oh no oh, thank you now we go on to something utterly utterly tragic by the way there's a grave for the musicians in the cemetery but they were buried where the graves were. <coughs> Mozart was in. Now we go on to a, a terraced out that threw the world in flames. And I'm referring to the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand on June the 28th, 1914. And they kept his personal effects. Unfortunately, it was a very dim hall, lit like a shrine. They kept his uniform, and this was the couch from which he died. Hmm? Yeah, so that's the area of that's the couch. They even kept his shoes, which was surprisingly small. That's his uniform in the English shot. Now this one unfortunately didn't come out well, but if you it did on the actual thing that you over there we saw bullet holes. Bullet hole there and a bullet hole there. And his wife Sophie was also shot in a random act of terrorism by Gallifold Princip, but who, now what they did, he was a member of the Black Hand, a member of the uh, Serbian nationalistic group which wanted to join Bosnia to Serbia. <coughs> they were still, still at it in the 1990s. And he had tuberculosis. And he wanted to be a big man and a martyr before he died of tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. So the Black Hand said to him, oh, can we go, Princey? Would you like to be a hero of Serbia? Well, it was only 19. He would not. Uh, and they said, well, you're not quite really ready for the physical material, are you? You collapsed when we were giving exercises. But here's some revolvers. You're inconspicuous. Go with some of your gang and assassinate the French Duke. So they knew how to pick on someone vulnerable and recruit them for their cause. And that was Sophie, she, she died. And, and Ferdinand and Sophie were in love with each other, but Franz Joseph disapproved. Let's move on. That was the car in which they died. It was an early Porsche, by the way. This shows you Europe in 1914. That's Germany, allied to Austria, allied uh, with fighting Serbia, who wanted to grab Bosnia there, which is there. Sarajevo was there. Turkey, and this was Europe going up in flames in 1914. Now let's look at the results of that assassination. This is war art. Serbian prisoners being led back to the rear. This shows you 1917, a very symbolic picture. A skull. So an act of terrorism was leading to these amazing, terrible horrors. 
And this shows you people mourning an aircraft pilot who had crashed. And his monument was to be like a, a crucifix on, on the propeller. So it shows the psychological trouble and the disturbance and the war. Now we come on to the Jewish court of Leth. I cannot understand Central European art unless you understand the contribution of the Jewish community. You can't separate the two. And this was Lessing, a philosopher who tried to call for tolerance between Christianity, Judaism and Islam in the 18th century. Now in one of these flats, Mozart had his last accommodation. All very civilised, 18th century, philosopher calling for tolerance, Mozart, let's move on. This shows you the, another contribution, which is Freud's waiting room. And they always had pictures of famous people. He liked to have pictures of Einstein and local worthies, you can see them there, and pictures from mythology. And also he loved to show his qualifications. You know, it's not, not changed. That's Freud, looking miserable. What I expect from a psychologist, happiness. And this shows you a Torah scroll are actually from the synagogue. And this shows you the rabbis of Bratislava. But the most chill, chilling thing was, we go back to Vienna to that square, was a memorial to the 65,000 Jews who were murdered by the Nazis. Only 1,000 came back. And that, and there was a big row about this memorial. I'll show you what it, you'll appreciate. That's me standing with the very grin, as well as the mind. And the war. The memorial was funny. It, had, it was a, consisted of a library of books in which the books were facing outwards, so you couldn't see the names. Yeah, so 65,000 Jews were murdered, and only 1,000 survived. And this was where Mozart, by the way, lived. So what struck me about Vienna was you reached the heights of brilliance and culture. And it reached the depths of depravity. It was a city of great light and great darkness. A city of great humanity and inhumanity. And you couldn't get your head around it. Let's move on. And there shows you the books outwards. That shows you the Jewish museum. Uh, museum. And that shows you a synagogue with some ornate tiles. Built in 1237 or thereabouts. Demolished in the pogrom in 1461. Anti-Semitism was rife in Austria and it's still a problem. Now we come on to something very, very interesting. An art college in Vienna. It shows you an artist and it shows you all the civilization. Grand building? Exactly the grand building. There's our tour guide, by the way. So on. Grand hall, sweeping. Built 19th century. And the chilling thing was, I'll go back, in that hall, Adolf Hitler was twice rejected from the art from that college. Once for art course, the second time for architecture. And it was in this grand building. It was, it was everyone found it difficult to get their hands around that he had been there twice, looking for jobs and failing each time. And then we found the Ringstrasse, and again this is our guide. He had these enormous houses. Again, showing opulence, status, be full of works of art. Only one family would live there with their servants, and there were quite a few of them, and they were Jewish families. And Hitler, in the nearby park, would often doss out as a vagrant. You began to see how the resentment and hatred built up and built up and built up. Let's move on. And that's what happened. Those were people who were deported and murdered by the Nazis. So you had to go back. So we found a lot of those in Bratislava. So they have these monuments outside the houses where people were deported. A real sense of guilt there. But I think in their simplicity, there's something very moving about them. Now we come on to something completely serious. The Vienna International Centre for the United Nations. It's one of the big United Nations area for, uh, for Europe. And it was so nice. It's true, it's got space, you know. It's nice clean lines. You know, it's 
each to his own, but when it was tight packed with security, we move on. And this shows you other buildings and commercial buildings. This was the banking sector. Showing the power of money. Showing the power of the United Nations. And this thing, which looked like a notion wreck, was a Catholic church. It was strange. It was quite nice, actually, inside. But outside, I thought, could have. And do you know what it reminded me? This walkway. Dalek City in Doctor Who. <laughs> but this is modern art. This is the shock of the new. This is, well, I, I have a person from Souls. Well, to me, it's fine. I, I love modern architecture. Mm. To me, yeah. it's fine. It's a space, it adapts, plenty of back coming in. Well, I was expecting to see a dark, Dalek tree walk right down there. Mm. But there, there was the United Nations. And there's street art, there's a lot of street art and graffiti, and I really like that, isn't that yes, charming? Now, this is the famous Ferris wheel of the Third Man. How many of you have heard or watched the film Third Man? Well, well, there's a theme where Harry Lyon opens the door of the Ferris wheel, and it's very high, and you wonder whether he's going to push this guy, of his friend and rival out. That was in the very much the Third Man. And what was interesting was the fairground was there in 1949 when the film was made. But a lot of the surrounding area was a bomb, was rubble, a bomb heap, uh, just nothing really. So it's interesting comparing what, what we saw with what was it like in 1949. And having been into the Austrian Museum and read the history of the period, that film, The Third Man, got the atmosphere at the time just right. Just right. Let's move on. And this is what's folk art, known as tinker art. The seventh man, this is Bratislava. Now, I like that. I like that mushrooms. In the 17th century, you had high unemployment amongst the gypsy population and among the farmers. So what they would do around is that they'd go around and tinker around with metal and make their things to sell from door to door. So this is very much a people's art, a peasant's art, and a gypsy's art. What well, I must say, I liked so it. Charming. There you go. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Sorry. And I go back. It has a charm, doesn't it? Yes. It has a charm to it. So this is folk art. This is popular art. We're away from the grand statesman or the great propaganda. And it reflects people struggling hard to survive. There's no joke being a gypsy in the 17th or 18th century <coughs> Europe, and there's a gypsy who are amongst the lowest of the low. But they brought something of beauty out of it, out of hardship. They made objects, some which were rather weird, but they made objects, some of which were quite beautiful and attractive. There was a lot of folk art in the museums and paintings, and some showed uh, an ordinary family at Christmas. So, what you have in Central Europe, at all levels, is a love of culture and the arts. It, uh, and I think this is where Central Europe can blaze a trail for us. Let's move on. Ah, yes. Advertising, uh, was it? Goulash, or, or, or the equivalent of a McDonald's advert. Oh. Commercial art with humour. I like it. Well, maybe you don't, but I do. You know, that was commercial. I was showing uh, goulash and meat. Let's move on. Now, finally, another uh, uh, article is uh, two great portraits of myself and my wife. Absolutely exquisite. But it's the third, one of my favourite arts was the manhole coming out of the cover done in the communist era in the 1950s, allegedly to celebrate the workers, I think in reality to take the mickey out of the communist party. And that was one of the most popular stops in Bratislava. Go note the McDonald's there, by the way, which we frequently yeah, really. yeah. But look at that. You know, and they had a smile on his face. So that was an example of modern folk art and the use of art with humour. The use of art to contain amusement. 
So that, so what I've done is I've taken you for a Cook's tour for the ages. Perhaps the emphasis has been on history rather than art. But what I've tried to show you is that art can fulfil various of purposes. It can puff up the officials, the emperors, the generals, etc. It can show the domination of an authoritarian system like the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. It can also record people who are utter fools. I'm going to come back to that. And it can also record what happens when the creativity goes in the wrong direction. Do that. But it also can convey something of the values of ordinary people and the humour of ordinary people. Now one thing, one of the most greatest <coughs> artistic things we actually saw was actually, we visited about three crypts and cemeteries, you know. We loved to visit crypts and cemeteries. And we went into the Habsburg crypt, which lasted from about the 1600s, and the latest Habsburg was buried in 2011. And we came across this grand grandulant tomb, tomb to Franz Joseph. Yeah, there were with side whiskers. Next to him was his divorce, a strange wife who left him, Sid called Sissy, who was stabbed to death in 1898 by anarchists in Genoa. In the other tomb beside him was his son Rudolf, who shot himself and his mistress in 1889. So all this grand grandulence, yet this domestic tragedy. But what the tomb showed of Franz of Joseph with the fanners, the bags and the, em and the emblems, was in aged 84, following the Franz Duke of assassination of Jean Franz Archduke Ferdinand, a man he didn't really like. Franz Joseph allowed and, and encouraged his ministries, ministers to go towards Serbia in 1914. That was the tinderbox which set the whole of Europe and then the world ablaze. At the age of 84, he, uh, after nearly ruling for 70 years, well, he uh, helped set Europe ablaze. What an achievement for a man of that age. So you can, sometimes to see the stories, to see the history behind them, but a more positive note was the Emperor Maria Theresa, whose portrait you will find there, and her husband. She designed a tomb like a wedding bed. And there's her and uh, her husband, who wasn't always faithful, but he did a lot for the culture of Vienna, sitting up looking at each other as if they were a newly married couple. And you could tell that the look from her was absolute love to her husband. Maria of Theresa who reigned in the middle of the 18th century and was a very formidable queen, uh, did a lot for her Viennese culture. You know, she, she was magnificent. But to, again, people telling stories of their lives. You know, either this is our marriage, this was the best thing for me, or hiding the stories. This was a blundering old fool who caused a world war. So, so uh, but the most moving thing was that so much coffins of the young children. The leading royal family of Europe had an incredibly high child mortality rate. Mm -hmm. And you know, we were quite moved by those, weren't we? So uh, 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 we couldn't take any photographs down there because we weren't allowed to. But seeing the Habsburg uh, crypt was one of the most moving experiences in our life. And of course I went into history lecture mode with Jew which he well readily appreciated in the Swedish admiration. So, what in final impressions do I take back from our visit? I think when it comes to combining arts, it's been done before, it's been done for centuries in Central Europe. And I think that's something we can learn and continue with. I think we can learn that the arts can bring beauty, humour, uh, and uh, to life, and even challenge the status quo. But if creativity goes in the wrong direction, or, or, or it's thwarted, then it can assume very dangerous proportions. So to sum up, what we saw in Vienna, and to a lesser extent Bratislava, was great light, also great darkness, 
and also a lesson from history and a warning from history. That's it.